Well, let's let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to everyone. I'm really pleased to have you all here this afternoon. This is the fourth annual Oxford Development Studies lecture. Um, so we're excited with the series and to see where it's going. Um, a little disappointed that we're yet again online, but one of the reasons, one of the advantages of doing these online is that we can have speakers who don't actually have to travel and who we might not otherwise be able to get here at Oxford. Um, let me just, as a, a, another piece of welcoming you, really remind you that this is sponsored by ODS and encourage you both to take a look at the journal, to read it, and also to consider it as a place to submit your articles that are relevant for development studies. What I'm going to do next is turn this over to Nandini Guptu, who is the chair of the journal, of the board for the journal, to have her do the introduction. Sorry, tried on mute. Um, Good afternoon, everyone, and I would like to uh, add my welcome, um, Cheryl's welcome to, in welcoming all of you to this lecture, and a particularly warm welcome to Professor uh, Nai Poon, who's our lecturer today, and I'm delighted to introduce her. She's an eminent sociologist of capital and labor in China, with a huge body of publications, uh, both books and articles in a large variety of journals, such as Sociology, Sociological Review, Work, Employment and Society, The China Quarterly, Public Culture, Cultural Anthropology, to name but a few. In all her work, uh, Professor Poon has masterfully brought together, on the one hand, macrostructural analysis of Chinese capitalism and the state in interplay with the global neoliberal market economy, and on the other, local and micro level working class life worlds an experience of both exploitation and resistance. Her first book, a richly textured ethno ethnography um, in a factory in Shenzhen, was on the lives of rural migrant women <clears throat> and how these were shaped by global capitalism as well as Chinese patriarchy and the state. So this book called Made in China, Women Factory Workers in a Global Workplace, won the 2006 C. Wright Males Award one of the most prestigious book awards in sociology, presented annually by the Society for the Study of Social Problems, to a single book that most effectively critically addresses an issue of contemporary public importance, brings to the topic a fresh imaginative perspective, and explicitly or implicitly contains implications for courses of action. <clears throat> that says it uh, all really about this extremely important book. Her second book is relevant to all those who use Apple products, iPhones and Macs. Dying for Apple, Foxconn and Chinese Workers uh, in, uh, was published in 2006 and it's co-authored with Jenny Chan and Mark Selden. It reveals how the pressures and demands put by Apple on manufacturers of Apple products in China precipitate intense exploitation of Chinese workers. It also showed the important role played by young trainee interns in these factories, which seems to be a peculiarly Chinese phenomenon. Both of these books have been translated into German, French, Italian, Spanish, Polish, and Chinese. And two of these books were also awarded Hong Kong Book Prize in 2007 and uh, 2011 as the top 10 popular books in Hong Kong and mainland China. Her third book is Migrant Labor in China, Post-Socialist Transformation, published in 2016. This is based on several vast research projects that she and her team conducted on a pyramidical system of subcontracting and the forms of protest that this generated. Professor Poon has also researched social media and the mobilization of digital networks, I mean, of digital networks of communication for resistance. In her recent work, she has challenged theories drawn from the experience of the global North about the decline of working class unity and shown how young workers forge bonds of solidarity and exercise their agency. We hope to hear more on this in today's lecture. I will now hand over to Professor Poon. Thank you. Thank you. It is really my honor to give a, a, a talk and sharing my career here. And I would like particularly to thank Nadini. Cheryl and also Gwena, who is behind the scene, but <laughs> who is the one really communicating with me. 
So thank you so much uh, for all of you. Uh, today, my talk is uh, really about uh, youth work, pro-social behavior, and micro-foundation of working class solidarity in China. Um, little bit background of, I mean, the major concern. Um, uh, I mean, uh, because, of, um, because of the current research, um, I, I get to notice that actually the majority of the young people um, while they are doing, uh, while they are doing the education, while they are attending attending their school, they are actually working, and but there's little attention, I mean, to this uh, to these issues, and I mean simply because that we, I mean, we think that there's nothing really worth to look at this issue because the work regime is always neoliberal, and their work experience are precarious. And there's little one to discuss working class solidarity, especially from, I mean, from the perspective of the young people. But I would like uh, to I mean, change this, I mean, this view uh, by uh, a kind of review the working class solidarity uh, through uh, a multiple layer of social behavior by the student uh, who has experienced. So um, this paper uh, basically compiles of uh, two studies. And I'm working with uh, one sociologist and uh, who is my colleague, and also one uh, psychologist who is also my colleague as well. So I mean, it's really based on the hardware uh, they that they provide uh, the quantitative methodology support uh, to my studies. As Nadini has introduced me, uh, I was basically a, a, quant a qualitative study person. Uh, training in sociology and anthropology, so I was quite I, I was quite excited uh, to learn from my colleagues and work together to contribute this paper. So um, this paper, uh, I mean, uh, uh, composed of uh, two studies. The first one is that we uh, we work to construct a kind of working class solidarity measure. Uh, we call it WCSM. Um, uh, and that was, uh, I, I will introduce this to you in a bit later. Um, so, and the same study was, um, I learned from my colleague again, that we tried to use a, a, a kind of structural, structural equation model, uh, try to predict that uh, if we can find post-social behavior among uh, the young people, especially among the students at the vocational school, whether uh, those um, uh, post-social behavior can predict Working class solidarity. So I mean, this fun for me this, I mean, because I really learned a lot um, from my uh, from my colleague. Um, so um, the, the background or the context of this study is that um, fifty percent of the working class youth actually is not only in China, but it's quite worldwide. They are working, and then they are also under quite precarious working conditions, and. And um, it means that this working class uh, youth, they are still attending their school. And if they are in mainland China, and if we visit the vocational training school, I would say that the percentage is even higher. Sometimes sometimes can reach uh, uh, around 80 to 90 percent. That means that every student need to work during, uh, during weekdays after uh, the class, or that everybody have to work on Saturday and Sunday. So um, um, this little, uh, as I have said, this little attention uh, to this experience. And if we pay attention to this experience, we, we will often think that, that um, I mean, this experience, they are so negative because they are so detrimental to human agency, especially when they are really work in a unsecure and precarious labor, uh, labor market. So my study this time, uh, I try to combine sociological and social psychological perspective, and we try to explore whether we can really find certain kind of positive positive outcome uh, of those youth. Uh, even though I obviously I agree entirely agree that uh, the working condition is I mean is really exploitative and also and very precarious, and there's little protection to those uh, student. Who's those student labor, if we call them student labor, uh, that means that they are they are still a student. They are not really a workers, but they have to work all. I mean, I mean, have to work uh, all the time. So uh, under that kind of situation, can we figure out certain kind of positive outcome uh, in the sense of 
pro-social behavior. And the concept of pro-social behavior, obviously, uh, I learned from the social psychological perspective. That means that they are willing to support each other. Uh, they are willing uh, to help each other, especially in certain uh, 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 in certain uh, conditions. So um, I try to use uh, the pro-social behavior uh, to help me uh, to build a, a sort of micro foundation of working class solidarity. So um, uh, as people know my work, I, I was um, um, my training was moved a little bit from uh, post-structure uh, to a kind of classic Marxist tradition. Uh, and then uh, I feel on uh, the classic Marxist tradition, uh, look at the class of solidarity, but at the same time, I also try to move beyond that tradition and look at uh, if there's no economic crisis, if there's no conflict, uh, can, can young people still uh, develop working class solidarity? So that's why uh, that's, the, that's the background uh, of the study. And the conceptual frameworks that as I just mentioned that I rely on sociological theory uh, to build uh, the working class solidarity nation. So uh, I, I review uh, 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 those literature and most of those uh, sociological literature, uh, again, uh, we, we emphasize on class background, socioeconomic status, and especially use the class background and, and their socioeconomic status to predict uh, their behavioral tendency. So I, I was based on those theory uh, try to work up uh, seven elements that we can uh, measure or we can understand what is a working class solidarity. So these uh, seven elements including social ties, share sentiments, and this sentiment obviously means that um, um, uh, share class sentiments. Uh, it's not that difficult uh, to understand in a Chinese context, especially when those uh, migrant children they're working. Uh, at one hand, they are studying in the vocational school, and on the other hand, they're working inside factory uh, like Boscom. So it's quite easier for them to understand that uh, uh, the, the employer and 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 the employee they actually belong to I would say that to different worlds, even though. Uh, they are all these two different worlds. Uh, this experience they uh, at the same time uh, that occur in China, and so um, I move from share sentiments to share interests. Uh, that's I mean, I mean everybody has an interest uh, in classic mass uh, studies. We we have a I mean we have a sort of uh, uh, interest to understand that the share uh, interest and common values. I mean, they're the very uh, they're, they're the foundations of uh, of the working class formation of working class solidarity, and then we move from uh, those common values to look at uh, whether uh, they have mutual support, and also from uh, mutual support um, when necessary, we they uh, develop uh, joint actions, and uh, I I I ask. Uh, one more lab, uh, one more layer. There is uh, interaction, communication, and cooperation, uh, which also draw on the current experience that most of us young kids uh, they rely on digital channel uh, to communicate with each other and support each other. So I uh, I use these uh, seven uh, elements and then try to uh, uh, look into uh, the working experience inside the vocational school uh, in China. Okay, and then I move to look at uh, the the, uh, the social psychological studies, uh, which help me to explore attitudes and the social values of each individual. In, in each individual, and uh, that means that they support me to look at, at the everyday life level whether uh, they have the following uh, pro-social behavior. Uh, usually, uh, uh, this concept uh, we refer to. Uh, a kind of willingness to, to help to support each other, uh, whether they will be fair and friendly to others, um, uh, and whether they will measure solidarity at the everyday life levels, and also uh, whether they can generate a web of connection, which are quite vital for the students to survive for in a precarious working and living condition. And I will give you a lot more example and move on. And, uh, uh, maybe 
maybe give you one example here that, like, uh, um, for example, that uh, those students, they really need to look for, uh, look for casual work. And that means that they look for a number of employers uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, so for example, when we, they need to work inside a restaurant uh, to become a waitress or waiter, or and the other week they, they have to work and then dispute uh, leaflets uh, for the property aging, for the property aging companies. So they really have to work for a number of uh, bosses then they need to look for uh, different kinds of information uh, that, that, that they can get. So obviously they need to um, share the information uh, and then share the work experience and then to inform each other whether uh, this employer is a good employer and then whether this employer uh, will be, I mean, will pay them uh, in time. Because, uh, I mean, quite often, I mean, when I visit uh, these uh, this young kids uh, in different parts of China, and most of these kids, they, they, they often have to face um, the working without uh, the payment. And then they really have to fight seriously uh, to get back their salary. So that's why uh, I, I highlight here that uh, post social behavior in terms of develop, developing a, a web of connections quite vital uh, for them. So just uh, some of this example here. And, 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 and the last one uh, uh, is that uh, we would like to challenge the, uh, the, the bias and discriminations against uh, uh, the migrant children uh, when they are working in the city. Uh, the urban uh, people um, usually don't trust them, but they still they need to use them. And then I, I we try to work counter, I mean, to those bias and, and those discrimination uh, by showing that those working class kids they, even though uh, they, they have in less, that means that they're coming for, from a working class family, they have less resources, um, they have uh, less uh, social status, uh, but they are willing to give, uh, to give in more. So having less and giving more is possible. And obviously uh, why I rely on uh, my colleague to, to do quantitative uh, uh, research, simply we, we need to collect uh, and, uh, substantial evidence uh, to demonstrate that uh, having less and giving more is, is possible. So that's why uh, people are curious, I mean, of my study, why I suddenly uh, working with the quantitative people. And this is almost my first time actually. So uh, move to, uh, to focus a little bit about uh, the conceptual framework here. So the study would like to build a link between social behavior with working class solidarity. And uh, uh, the previous studies, uh, when they looked at the solidarity issues, they, would, they either focus on workplace or they focus on uh, community, uh, but they seldom, uh, they look at school. Um, but uh, uh, based on my uh, a number of years of uh, field work in vocational school, I would say that the vocational school is actually quite a significant institution that serves as a backdrop for nurturing class solidarity and identity. And that was, I mean, that was quite frequently neglected in the class analysis and uh, in the labor studies or in the development studies. So um, uh, when we move into uh, and get uh, get familiar with the school students. I um, I, I I can not only I mean I mean even though uh, those students they are uh, quite frequently stat I mean, stigmatized as loser uh, in the Chinese education system because they um, most of people we think that because you are not a good student and you cannot get into the university and that's why you end up in vocational and training school. So in the educational hierarchy, they are still, I mean, they are still, they already, I mean, discriminated, I mean, I mean uh, at whole systems. So um, I, I would like to try to demonstrate that, I mean, even though uh, they will be stigmatized uh, as uh, losers, and some of them, uh, some of these students even internalize um, uh, uh, the sense of um, uh, self-recognition. But uh, 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 we can still find a lot of examples to demonstrate that they are uh, actually they are keepers. Uh, they, are, uh, they are willing to support each other. And the logic of, uh, of this, I mean, having less but keeping more is not because that 
the working class students, um, they have higher, uh, they have higher morale, or they, uh, they are much uh, better people. I mean, we are not using the ethic uh, uh, to look at these issues. I look at the actually the everyday life uh, survival laws in the sense that uh, they have to, uh, to become givers, uh, they have to support each other simply because uh, they are lacking resources. And, and if they would like to support uh, themselves, they really need to cooperate with each other. And we have to, re we have to remember that most of these uh, vocational school students, uh, they're coming from the rural migrant families and their parents, they are not, they are not with them. That means that their parents, they're working, uh, their father always working on the construction sites. And their mother uh, working in a factory or their mother working in a restaurant. And these students, they live on the boarding school. And that means that actually uh, their parents already hand over them uh, to, uh, uh, to the school. And, and also these students rely on themselves to earn money uh, to support uh, 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 the ex their daily expenses. Um, so um, so that's, the, uh, that's the background. And then we move from this uh, background to look at, I mean, how uh, 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 we look at the logic. We, we move from the logic and then to look at how uh, the logic of survival among uh, the working class people. Uh, they have to practice uh, different kinds of pro-social behavior in order to support themselves. And then this pro-social behavior was actually embedded in very specific uh, organizational sectors or institutional bases like the school, like the workplace and like the community. Um, so uh, we, we use uh, uh, this behavior uh, 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 and they would figure out them and then we put it on one hand and then on the other hand we try to construct a kind of working class solidarity measure uh, uh, to uh, to take into uh, the seven elements I just introduced and to see whether uh, the poor behavior have a correlation of the working class solidarity measure and whether they can predict it. So that is I mean the whole conceptual framework of my study. Okay so let me uh, uh, quickly move to the debate. Um, this study, obviously, we engage in the working class solidarity de uh, 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 debate in the sense that um, when the uh, when the masses uh, 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 studies, uh, they usually adopt a macro structural approach. So, uh, uh, and I mean, unlike the postmodern studies, or unlike uh, uh, guy standings, uh, precarious class studies. They, they, they predict a kind of, I mean, the end of working class solidarity. They think that uh, forming uh, solidarity is quite, is quite much impossible. I mean, given that uh, the working class was, was so divisive and so fragmentary and the labor market was very, very uh, precarious. But the masses uh, debate always, I mean, counter, uh, that kind of uh, that kind of argument, um, but they look at the macro approach. So they we try to explain class conflict, social grievances, economic crisis, and connect. I mean, uh, to the nature of the capitalist capitalist society. So Marx's uh, study we always emphasize historical materialism, and also uh, everybody if they're the masses, they we I mean, look at uh, the economic crisis uh, as a result of or as a kind of uh, inevitable uh, outcome of the modern capitalist uh, systems, and and that that create the base to unite the working class, uh, who anyway we, we we share common interests and also share common well view, and that is I mean that is the base uh, of uh, of uh, of the argument. Then uh, if we uh, 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 that kind of debate. Uh, 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 was very um, important between 19th century uh, to the 20th century uh, uh, history, especially when, when we observe uh, social, socialist revolution uh, in, uh, in, I mean, in certain part of the world, especially uh, when, we look at, uh, when we look at China. Um, how, but however, um, when we move to the, late, the late, later part of the 20th, 20th century, uh, when we have the 
global uh, neoliberal neoliberal turn. Uh, that means that uh, uh, those uh, socialist ideas and also uh, uh, the ideas uh, of working class solidarity uh, become obsolete or become outdated or become utmost or become useless because uh, they cannot explain uh, 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 the condition of the working class and also cannot explain uh, the decline of the labor movement uh, in the Western society. And when the coming of, a, of the post-industrial uh, society, or sometimes we call them consumer society, or sometimes we call them risk society, uh, become the dominant form uh, in the Western part or in, uh, in the developed societies, then uh, uh, the, uh, we, we predict that uh, all those uh, new social transformation, they will have a negative structural effect on the class force and will put an end, uh, uh, put an end to working class solidarity. And the, the recent debates on the precariousness and also um, on the precarious class uh, even pre I would say, the even pre discussion on positive outcome, of, of, on any positive outcome of what of, of experience and any positive uh, uh, and any potential of work uh, solidarity. And there's some scholar obviously that would like uh, to re, re articulate uh, uh, the notion. Uh, the earlier one, obviously, is uh, Rick and Tashir. And Rick uh, tried to, I mean, develop the concept of cultures of solidarity, uh, even though he still paid a lot more attention uh, at, the, at the times of crisis that we generate the condition um, for, for, for collective action. But then he already paid uh, uh, substantial attention to daily practices, mutual support, shared sentiments, and also the processes of organization of building. I mean, all these factors, they're central uh, to class cohesion and uh, solidarity. And Kim Royce, obviously, uh, is the one uh, who adopted uh, a comparative approach in historical perspective, uh, trying to argue that working class formations not necessarily happen uh, at the point of production. They can, I mean, they can, uh, they can formulate in the community, and they can also formulate at the labor, at the labor market. So all labor market as well as the as as well as the community, uh, they are the right to size uh, to formulate working class uh, solidarity. And the most current study by uh, Morgan and Puli Nano, um, who try to say that is actually this is not the end of solidarity, but the question is what sort of solidarity are now and emerge. Uh, what, what sort of solidarity are now emerging and how. So um, especially when I try to uh, um, um, bring those debate uh, into the global south context, um, obviously, uh, I mean, uh, I would say that the working class of solidarity issue is so important uh, if, we, if we would like uh, uh, to regenerate uh, 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 the debate and also uh, give some hope uh, for the for the young generation and also and for the win for the young working class people. So I um, I revisit those theories and and use those theory to help us to construct a working class uh, solidarity measure. So uh, I I I move into the vocational education school uh, in China. It's like fifty percent of them we end up in tertiary education. Another 50% of them, we end up in vocational school. And uh, the central government actually uh, in, in a huge amount of, in, of investment into the vocational education. When they try to upgrade uh, the Made in China model uh, to innovation model uh, to, to China innovation. So uh, they need to upskill uh, 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 to upskill and also to, to enhance the technology and also those knowledge need to acquire uh, by the people, uh, uh, by those young kids, they are still willing to work inside uh, the factories, especially for those uh, 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 automobile uh, industries and high-speed uh, railway uh, industries and digital uh, platform economies. So um, for them, uh, uh, vocational education is so important 
uh, to train for the young and for the future working class subjectivity. So, so they are the cradle for us to understand uh, the working class solidarity. And working class education and schools, they provide multiple sites uh, for us to look, in, uh, to look into collectivity and solidarity, because it, uh, this vocational education link up on the one hand schools and on the other hand workplaces. And all the vocational schools, they need to do interns at, the, at their final years. And, and, and the majority of the, of the students immediately uh, move into work, uh, into uh, the intern uh, uh, company. Where they, I mean, where they place the internship. So, so it's a, I would say that it's a, it's a good sign for us, for us to, to really to understand uh, uh, the, the, the situation. And it's, they, they also provide us, I mean, uh, uh, the sites for us uh, to observe uh, a kind of um, various uh, social behavior, and uh, in, in both, I mean, in schools and workplace. And we can observe whether they can really uh, potentially support each other. And when we move uh, uh, to construct uh, the measure, um, uh, we look into, I mean, we, we not only look into everyday life, but at the same time, we also look into the structural and organizational factors. Um, but we focus at the everyday life practice. So we try to identify or we try to define uh, the working class based solidarity. Uh, by a set of acts, sentiments, and values that unite the working class kids. And we come, we try to enrich uh, the seven elements I just introduced you uh, to formulate uh, a whole concept of solidarity. And then we use these seven elements to measure uh, whether we can uh, observe uh, the working class and uh, solidarity uh, inside uh, the vocation schools. And then, so that is, I mean, that's that's the framework of the of, of the measure. And then on the top of this measure, uh, we view on we we look at uh, the three la the three layers of social behavior. And these three uh, layers of social uh, social behaviors, um, uh, we look at daily helping, uh, school volunteering, and school society activities. So altogether, we try to study the correlation between uh, post-social behavior and solidarity. But I need to, I mean, remind, uh, remind you that obviously uh, when you really visit uh, the vocational school uh, in China, you can find fighting everywhere. Uh, you can find that the students sticking and uh, not really listening uh, 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 to their teachers. And most of these young kids are uh, uh, they really don't have uh, uh, parental care, and they have really rely on themselves. And those, and they, uh, and they, work and also live uh, in the community. They connect the school uh, with the workplace. So um, um, I, I don't want to say that uh, uh, we, we, I mean, we could only find pro-social behavior. We obviously we can find anti-social behavior. I mean, like. Current studies or life existence studies, when they look at the, uh, the student at the secondary uh, school level or the vocational school level, they look at the anti-social behavior. So my study was I mean, purposely trying to I mean uh, to supplement I mean that studies and trying to figure out uh, post-social behavior was also possible uh, 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 to be figured out. So let me quickly move uh, into study one. And how we uh, how we develop uh, the WCSM. So uh, 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 in uh, 2018, uh, we visit uh, two uh, vocational school uh, in Guizhou in Lanzhou, which is the western part of China and the poorest area uh, uh, in China. Um, so we select, uh, we collect uh, more than 500 sample uh, in Guizhou village and in Guizhou College and another uh, 300 uh, sample in the Lanzhou uh, 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 College. Then we run an online survey uh, for those who have part-time and for those who have intern experience. And we figure out that 70% of them have to work part-time, but then 30% of them will have internship experience because most of the students, when they have intern experience, that you have to wait until the final years. So that's why majority of them actually they have uh, part-time work 
and only a small proportion of them they have uh, or relatively a small proportion of them they have internal experience. So anyway, we look at the work experience and only those work experience can help us uh, uh, to look into whether they will have a working class solidarity behavior. And before we construct uh, the measure, uh, we, we provide in the interview uh, with 30 students and also run two focus groups uh, um, uh, with students. And, and based on the interviews, the interviews and the focus groups, we try to establish the descriptive items, uh, try, to, uh, uh, try to look into whether they can help us to construct a measure. So let me quickly move into those items. Um, and then uh, uh, maybe I, I, I uh, explain a little bit about uh, the 10 items uh, we developed from the interviews and the focus groups. And then uh, uh, we, we use uh, these 10 items uh, to run the survey. And then after the survey, uh, we run a factor analysis and try to uh, look into whether uh, these 10 items can tap into the seven elements uh, of, the, uh, of the working class solidarity that I have explained. So the first item is that um, we ask them, apart from work, uh, you and your colleagues usually do other activities together. So that is trying to measure whether they have um, developed their social ties. And the second one is that uh, when being upset at work, uh, your colleagues and you will share each other's troubles. That means that they will share sentiments. And then uh, the item three is that when you are in trouble, your colleagues will help you. That means you to support. And I don't post that when your colleagues are in trouble, uh, you will help your colleagues as um, that's I mean, you help the others and the others help you. And the item five is that uh, your colleagues and you will take action together to fight for welfare and work. Uh, that means uh, joint actions. Um, actually, I, 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 I can share a little bit. Uh, uh, I mean, the quantitative data to this is not as interesting as few I, 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 I really like to, to, to tell you. Uh, because when, when I visit, I, um, when I visit them, um, uh, it's every week they have we really have to work, and then they uh, they uh, they bring my research team and me and to visit them at the workplace, and and it's usually they they either uh, uh, I mean they work but they never get paid, so how could they really I mean get paid? So they have the WhatsApp. Uh, they have uh, they have WeChat. WeChat is I mean the most popular uh, social media uh, uh, apps in mainland China. So those young kids we uh, we WeChat uh, uh, their their classmates, and then they will suddenly call twenty or thirty uh, students. Uh, they are quite young at the age of fifteen or sixteen, and then they suddenly uh, surround uh, in front of uh, 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 the restaurants and give pressure. Um, for the restaurant boss uh, to pay them uh, to pay them back, or they uh, or sometimes um, uh, 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 they we argue with uh, their their bosses if they get I mean uh, get uh, if they got in injuries, and sometimes there's not that serious injuries, so uh, uh, the bosses were never willing uh, to pay them or take them to the hospitals. So those young kids again they have to support each other. And they have to argue with their bosses uh, to to get that little bit I mean compensation. So this is how this, even though they're very young, uh, but uh, uh, different kind of uh, joint actions or different kind of collective actions. Even though we cannot use uh, the concept strike, uh, protest. I mean to describe the situations, but different forms of joint actions you can always you can always observe. Okay, so uh, let me move into six item that uh, young colleagues and you have similar and same views on the company. I mean, uh, uh, this, that can be easily observed. Uh, they usually share each others. Uh, 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 I mean, they discuss and comment uh, on each employer. So uh, if uh, if they uh, 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 they you they quite often uh, use fab language. Uh, I mean. Uh, to discuss their bosses, and that, so this is is easy. It's easy to observe that even even though they are quite young, and even though they will not use the concept class, but but that kind of class sentiments uh, uh, is is quite easily felt, and you 
you can easily share uh, we share with uh, those uh, uh, those young kids uh, um, when they really have been working and uh, their pay uh, was, was some of them they can really get pay after work that means the on daily payment but uh, most of them have to wait for two to three months in order to to, uh, to get the salaries and uh, they be they sometimes they debate uh, they they, they uh, depends on their own calculation and and that easily get into trouble or get uh, get easily uh, get into uh, uh, into argument uh, with uh, with their bosses and those bosses are usually small bosses in uh, in the small town. Okay, so then let me move into items uh, seven. So uh, we will also ask as a whole, you believe that. Uh, your colleagues and and your benefits in the company are the same. Are the same. That means that uh, they they working for the same wage, uh, in the same positions, and so uh, they share the same goodnesses, and also they share uh, they share the same interests. And uh, we also test whether uh, your colleagues and 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 you they believe in the view that uh, being labor is score risk uh, that that try to measure the common values and. I need to supplement a little bit here that uh, labor is always is a kind of uh, socialist uh, slogan that uh, in the socialist period, um, uh, being a working class uh, as being uh, the master of your country. So labor, laboring is always. And so that kind of legacy, I mean, obviously is disappearing uh, in many, many places. Uh, but some of the school, uh, they will still teach them, uh, try to prepare them uh, to be the future, uh, to be the future uh, 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 proper workers. So the teachers, uh, especially in the Western part of China, we still teach them uh, labor stories. So we try to, uh, try to see whether they believe in the slogan or not. So this, uh, we try to mention the common values. Okay, and then the common values we also uh, see uh, with the, uh, the colleagues and the students, they believe that workers be unite among themselves. Uh, uh, whether they think that uh, they should be stand, I mean, uh, at at uh, at the size of uh, the managers, the bosses, or they should stand uh, with uh, with their peers, uh, with their colleagues, and with the workers. So there is the common values. Then the final one, we uh, we look into uh, how how they discuss and also how they solve the problem, uh, whether they use different kinds of digital techniques um, um, uh, to enhance the interaction, the communication, and, and et cetera. Yeah. So, um, so we, uh, 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 after we build the measure and, and we run uh, the survey, uh, so we, uh, we try, we are able to prove that actually there's correlation between uh, this correlation between uh, uh, the work experience and also uh, 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 where they're from. I mean, most of them, uh, they're from the rural areas, 75%, uh, they're from the rural areas. And if they're from the urban areas, they're actually from the working class families. So we see that uh, the part-time of the casual job experience and the interns uh, experience they have a correlation uh, with uh, uh, with the uh, with the working class solidarity measure, and uh, we use uh, the factor analysis to uh, uh, to, to, val to validate it. So that's the first studies, and then from the first studies uh, we move to the second studies. Uh, is that we try to see uh, whether we can use the measure. Uh, 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 move into another nine vocational schools where we can collect more than 8,000 uh, samples uh, from, the uh, from the nine vocational schools, which cover six uh, Chinese provinces, which means almost cover uh, uh, the, uh, the whole countries. And then we try to look at, uh, um, I mean, uh, apart from uh, the working class solidarity measure, the 10 items, uh, uh, we include in the survey. Uh, in in this in the uh, second studies, uh, we add on daily helping uh, school volunteer and school society activities among uh, the young students, and also we add 
also we add more experience into the survey. And also we look into, I mean, uh, look into uh, the demographic information, including uh, gender, age, and region, and also the Hukou um, uh, system. Uh, the Hukou uh, in China simply means that if you're born in the rural, you will have a rural Hukou. If you're born in the urban, you will have an urban Hukou I mean, at the beginning of, uh, uh, of your life. So, um, uh, at the end, we so we run uh, this survey, and then uh, based on this survey, we try to uh, use a kind of structural equation model uh, to uh, to test whether um, and, and also to predict uh, whether the post-social behavior uh, can predict within class solidarity. Um, so first of all, we again we use factor analysis. Uh, 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 to confirm uh, whether the WCSM uh, in the previous studies can be applied in the current studies, that is the, sec uh, the second studies, and uh, the result uh, proved uh, positive. And then, so it's after uh, uh, this, uh, after we build these correlations, and then we move uh, to use a uh, structural equation model uh, uh, to prove it. So um, for the post, uh, for the post-social behavior, if you look at this picture, uh, uh, the post-social behavior, we look at three layers. So the first layer is uh, daily happening, uh, the second layer is school volunteering, and then the third one is uh, school society activities. And again, I, I, I still would like to share with you my few, my few experience in, I mean, instead of, I mean, those uh, dry data. Um, uh, uh, Give you examples that I mean how those young uh, young kids support each other. Um, as I just mentioned, most of them uh, they they I mean they live inside uh, the campus. Uh, they are the boarding schools. So uh, from uh, uh, and the management of the boarding schools is, is like this. After three to four p.m., I mean all the school teachers. Uh, uh, we leave the schools, and most of the schools will be uh, we located in the suburban areas. But the teachers, uh, uh, I mean, like in Hong Kong or in, or in Berlin, China, or in elsewhere, I mean, they're the middle class people. So they didn't live in the suburban areas. They live in uh, in the city, in, in inside the city. So, so it, I mean, after uh, uh, after classes uh, in the late afternoon time or in the evening time, I mean, only one or two uh, still uh, one or two teachers uh, will stay and look after them. So it means that nobody should really manage them. So in times of sickness, uh, uh, um, in times of I mean uh, any kind of problems, uh, they really have to support each other. And I observe that that they. Um, they really uh, uh, run to, I mean, to the medical, uh, to the medical store uh, uh, to buy, uh, 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 to buy uh, the medicines um, for, uh, I mean, for their peers and for uh, for their classmates or for their roommates. And that is, I mean, this really in terms of sickness. Then in terms of entertainment, I can also, I mean, observe that they, uh, for example, this uh, this young kid. Uh, uh, they are really lacking resources. So they will use uh, one, uh, one domain B uh, to download a movie, and then, uh, and then a group of students, they will, I mean, I mean, I mean, put together and watch uh, the movie together. So today, you can use one, uh, one domain B, I mean, to download a movie, another day, another students uh, use another dollar uh, 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 to download a, another movie. So we can see that even even the entertainment they 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 have to they have to uh, support each others uh, they have to share the resources. So there's the at the daily levels, and then the school volunteer. Uh, uh, once I visit a vocational a vocational school uh, in uh, in Xi'an, which is also a big, a big cities in the western part of China, and one one student's uh, father. Uh, uh, was a construction worker uh, who ran into a car accident and he was sent to the hospital for doing operation. But, but, they, but the family don't have enough money because uh, the operation was a huge one. 
So the teachers run a donation campaign uh, in the schools. And I see students queue up to donate their money. And I talk to one student. One student uh, tell me that they skip their breakfast in order to donate money to support, uh, to support uh, uh, this student's father. And when I ask them, I say, why, why are you doing this? These students immediately pay that, tell me that because we are coming from the poor families. Uh, we have sympathy, we know each other. And this time I support him, next time he will support me. So, so I mean, that kind of mutual support, uh, that kind of solidarity is, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, out of, uh, really out of survival logic. It's not, it's, it's not because of other, I mean, it's not because of other reasons. And then move to the student activity, student society activities, uh, because those young kids, uh, they, they don't really like learning, but they like uh, to participate in different form, different forms of school activities. So there's one, uh, there's one school society that impressed me is that uh, they, they organize uh, more than two to 300 students uh, across their own vocational school. There's, they they organize themselves in, at the city levels. And then they try to collect, uh, to collect the rubbish. They try to collect the oasis at the river sites in order to clean the rivers. So, uh, so one week I observed that they are doing that kind of activities. And then the other week I observed that they collect the clothes at the middle class, uh, at the middle class uh, uh, housing uh, estates, housing districts. Uh, and then they wash them and then they send, they send those second-hand clothes uh, to the mountainous poor, uh, poor areas uh, to distribute to the elderly people. So, so um, um, again, when you uh, when when we talk to those uh, young young students, they, they they say that why not? I mean, those uh, middle class people, uh, they are I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, they have a lot of resources, but uh, uh, they I mean, they easily they can throw away those their clothes, they can throw away uh, 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 their uh, their uh, their they are things, but those things, uh, uh, those clothes, they are still useful. So why not collect them and then send them to the mountainous areas? So again, we see, I mean, different kind of activities at the at the daily level, and then uh, we put them into the process of behavior. And obviously, uh, we when we need to do the survey, we I mean, we uh, we uh, we we organize those experiences, and then we we organize into to items into questions. So daily hacking, uh, we, we construct five items in order uh, to measure, uh, to ask whether they have daily hacking. In school volunteer, we have one item. In school activities, we have another items. And then we uh, use the structural equation model to test uh, whether uh, this they, uh, these three layers of social behavior, uh, they can predict working class solidarity in Ten items uh, I have just uh, explained to you, and again, again, I'm so happy to know that uh, the results are positive. So that means that uh, that means that we can predict. I mean, every item has uh, significant uh, uh, results. Uh, so three star, two star, two star means that they have uh, positive uh, and, uh, results. So that means that every every level of social behavior they can predict with us. So. Okay, so let me quickly uh, move into the discussion and close uh, uh, and close my, my my talk, and then we can we can have, we can have a lot more discussion later on. Um, so the first study uh, we, we we draw from the sharing of the students to reflect on their work experience, and especially for those students they have uh, part-time work experience or income uh, and income experience. And based on this, we develop uh, the working class solidarity measure and tap into the seven elements of solidarity. And actually, this uh, WCSM, I would say that this has not only can be used uh, in, in vocational school, we can also use in any, in, in, I mean, in other schools or other communities. And this measure uh, can also uh, be validated and further used in some other societies, not only in China. So after we construct uh, 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 this measure, we then move into 
uh, uh, to see whether uh, uh, whether uh, we can um, use this measure uh, uh, to build a correlation with the social behavior and to see whether uh, we can we can observe uh, different forms of cultures of solidarity uh, that I have been uh, that I have introduced uh, in the conceptual framework. So um, um, we use this to study uh, try to uh, try to understand the working class of solidarity and try to prove that it's possible. So uh, the first one, uh, the first contribution is that uh, uh, the WCSM is an ethical and validated measure, and that includes structural and organ organization factors as well as the everyday practices. So if you, you remember that uh, we look into uh, the common values uh, we, we measure uh, the shared interest, uh, we measure uh, uh, their social ties, and also we measure their joint actions. So actually, this WCSM still focuses on the social and organization factors. This means that we are not really moving away from the macro analysis. We're still trying to combine with those uh, uh, macro factors uh, 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 and also uh, with everyday life practice. So, um, and then that is the first contribution we really, we really have. And then the second uh, contribution is that we try to build a positive uh, association between social behavior and working class solidarity. Again, uh, try to prove, so trying to prove social behavior is, 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 always, uh, is always difficult. Uh, not to mention that we would like to prove that having less can give you more. I mean, there's quite, provocative and quite controversial, um, but uh, with the support of my, uh, of my colleagues, uh, we can really use the quantitative method uh, to prove that uh, um, inside uh, the night vocational schools, we can, uh, we can identify those uh, causes of behavior, not that difficult. And, 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 and if I just explain to you that according to my field work, uh, uh, a lot more story, a lot more story can be shared if you, if you really have time. So, so to me, that um, try to prove, uh, uh, try to use the three layers of social, uh, social behavior, uh, daily happening, school volunteer, and, and, and school society activities, uh, is trying to feel, uh, try to demonstrate that uh, those young kids, uh, they not only have pro social behavior, but those pro social behavior can also predict. Uh, working class solidarity. That means that if the student they have, they we have more pro social behavior than the others, they will demonstrate more working class solidarity. And 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 quite the opposite is that if this if the study uh, if the student uh, they we have anti social behavior, which we don't really input in our survey, but we also observe uh, we also uh, do observation and also few studies. And uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, difficult for them uh, uh, if those for those anti-social behavior students, uh, it's not easier for them uh, to join this, uh, the student societies and also uh, to demonstrate mutual support uh, when they really confront difficulties at the workplace. So um, uh, uh, let me quickly concluded is that uh, we, we try to demonstrate this a strong tendency uh, for the vocational schools from the working class family to build social connection and the mutual support. And that is the survival strategy of the working life. And that helps us uh, to, to, to build I mean, in the long run, a micro foundation of working class solidarity. And, and we try to challenge the post structure and the postmodern um, an argument that uh, is almost the end of working class. Uh, it's almost the end of working class. I mean, not to mention the, uh, the working class solidarity. So uh, our study tried to, I mean, argue that um, even though uh, uh, most of the work experience as precarious, uh, the labor market is frustrating, the work regime is neoliberal, but we can still, uh, I mean, uh, if if you, you are adopting a mass uh, analysis, analytical framework, 
which is not really an issue because those, I mean, those negative experience we create contradiction, and those contradiction is actually the social conditioning uh, for them to generate or transform it. Um, but to me, uh, those young kids, uh, they are too young I mean, uh, to generate strike, uh, unlike the forced home workers. Uh, so I would like to see whether at the everyday level, we can still formulate some kind of class-based solidarity and whether we can really discover a micro foundation of solidarity uh, at the level of everyday, uh, everyday practices. So that's the end of my, my presentation. And I hope you will not need to for me. For me. Great, thank you very much. And we now, we now have time for a few questions. So if you've got questions, I think um, if you raise your hand, I should be able to keep track of them and I will just call on people and invite you to speak your question out. Um, but I think Nandini, did you have a first question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, so that was really uh, fascinating and very uplifting and heartening as well. Um, and um, um, I, I, I really enjoyed your emphasis on schools. And, and of course, it's very relevant that, I mean, the emphasis on schools is very relevant in the Chinese case because students are in fact workers too. And you're talking about the solidarity that is generated through socializing at schools and in related community-based um, activities. Um, and so the emphasis here is really on sort of um, molding individual subjectivity through uh, schooling and other uh, activities, and here and that also incul uh, in, in, includes inculcation of pride in labor, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, through through the schooling system, and also support for each other um, and uh, uniting in various ways. Yeah, so I'm with you with that. Um, and the analytical focus then is on attitudes and social values of individuals. Um, and that clearly comes from your social psychology emphasis and social, social psychology is of course based on individual dispositions of cooperation and empathy. Yeah, um, so in a sense, you're kind of transcending one body of work that talks about, um, um, you know, self-maximizing individuals and you're quite clearly, you know, uh, um, uh, shooting that down. But that then takes me to two bodies of work, one of which you've explicitly mentioned, but the other is, um, collective action from which you jumped off the Marxist um, approach. And here the unit of analysis is the collective rather than the individual. It's always been the collective. So the unit of analysis is collective and the subject of analysis is collective action. And such collective action is also generated through labor process. So at the start, you talked about the biggest structures of capitalism, but of course the, the all of labor process theory is actually about the sort of, if you like, the micro level. So it's the labor process, the structures and processes at the plant or factory level, the actions of the management and so on that generates or not uh, working class solidarity. Yeah, and, and I wasn't entirely sure how you kind of shot that body of literature down, because clearly you, in this work, anyway, <laughs> all your work is about the workplace, uh, but in this work you haven't told us how the, the solidarity and uh, pro-social um, uh, dispositions generated in the school and the community context then manages yeah. to overcome, if you like, the atomizing and divisive um, effects of the labor process. Yeah, so that's the one kind of thing. The other one is uh, what I think you called um, uh, um, neoliberal type of work, uh, where, uh, where the emphasis is on post-industrial society, where the labor process is seen to be entirely um, uh, atomizing, that um, the way incentives and discipline are meted out, uh, these are focused on the individual rather than groups of workers. And as a result, workers, you know, you know the literature, that sort of thing. Yeah, yes, and, um, yes. and so because you didn't talk about either of those, it isn't clear mm. to me how what's happening in the schools manages to overcome both of these. How does it carry through? And at the end of the day, does it in fact generate any kind of collective working class activity? It, of course, you know, people support each other and, you know, complain together and, you know, and watch things together and all of that kind of thing. But does it actually generate working class solidarity as we would understand it in the sense of collective action against employers, even if not against capital in general? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, very good, very good. <laughs> I, I didn't really, uh, obviously I didn't really the labor process and, and uh, uh, theories or arguments because I, I was part of them. <laughs> so <laughs> my previous way was, over, I mean, was almost in, informed by, uh, by labor process theories. I just want to try to I mean, enrich it uh, a, a, a bit or extend it a, a bit like uh, the labor process uh, theories always I mean, look at, at the point of production. And, and obviously, I mean, if you are, if we are the workers, and, and uh, if we want to look at the collective action driven from uh, driven from work, obviously, I mean, uh, the sphere of production is, is still the major sites uh, for our observations. But for uh, for me, I mean, the subject a little, little bit complicates when they try to combine the student with the workers in China. We call them student labors, simply because uh, because of the force con studies I observe. Um, I mean. Thousands and thousands of students they're sending to work inside the force farm. So that's why we come up with a book and kind of I, I mean a few articles. So because of this project, I try to I mean try to broaden I try to broaden myself that if we try to confine a, a collective action simply within a web face, uh, that is not enough for us uh, to understand uh, the experience of those young kids. And when I really look into the issues, even when today I I move. To work in a working class university like Hong Kong called Minnan University. And I figured out that actually, even in Hong Kong, 70% of my students they have to work and nobody care about them and nobody discuss the issues. Maybe in Oxford, students don't really have to work. <laughs> and in Hong Kong, you students also don't have to work, but in Minnan University, 70% of them have to work. And they, they are quite shy uh, to, to, to share their experience. Until I try to, I mean, try to push them to open up the mouth and uh, to let me know, I mean, their working experience. So that's why I, I try to extend um, and try to understand the work experience uh, and moving, I mean, away from uh, the sphere of production to the sphere of social reproduction. And obviously, this, I mean, this massive feminism is always, <laughs> the issue is always how the social reproduction reshape the sphere of production. And we never put it into that kind of level. And uh, we always say that uh, these two spheres, the inter, I mean, the intersection, <laughs> they are sub, uh, they're mutual, and uh, they mutually uh, uh, shape each others. But how does, how the sphere of social reproduction really have a say, really have a weight on, on the sphere of production? So I think we need a lot more studies. And to me, uh, uh, this study is the beginning for me to, 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 become, to, to conceptualize the, the issues. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and the issues of um, neoliberalism that I mean, try to create individualized subjects. Uh, uh, that uh, the I mean that kind of uh, tendency is is very prevalent uh, uh, in in China and uh, I'm quite sure in, in elsewhere as well. So um, these students we always will be taught uh, to become uh, like you need to climb up the social level, especially you're from the poor areas. And the only hope for you is that you need to win at, at the volcano schools, they have a number of uh, number of uh, competitions. That means that you won different kinds of prizes. So the only the only part for them is that you win the prizes because you cannot get into the university. <laughs> so in order to, to win the prizes, obviously you need to create, I mean entrepreneur subject, competitive subjects. But then very interesting case I can observe that one of the students tell me that in order to in order to win those prizes at the provincial level, we really need to cooperate with each other. Uh, he told me that unlike student from Tsinghua University, Tsinghua is the Keep top tier university in China, so that you, I'm the Tsinghua students. I will not share my knowledge. I will not share my skill. I will not share, share the information with each others. But because we are from the Volcan School, we need to cooperate in order to win. So this is from the mouth of those young kids. So to me, uh, this is some of is some of the indications that, that, that they 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 will move. They they learn from uh, they. It's a kind of necessity. They move away from individualization toward uh, collectivity. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Are there others who have questions? I'm not seeing hands up. I don't know if you had a follow up, Mandini, that while people are pulling questions together, you get your answers. 
um, well, not context. so much follow up, but as a kind of general thought for the rest of us in the rest of the world, where we don't have, thankfully, perhaps this kind of exploitation of student interns. Uh, there isn't a site where similar pro-social behavior might be developed. So mm. the lesson for me seems to be there's still some hope in China, but for the rest of the world, there's no hope of working class solidarity because we don't have you know, this overlap of uh, schools and workplaces. Would you agree with that? Or, or, or are there other sites where we might be looking for those kinds of... Sure. Actually, the social psychologists at the, at the beginning, I uh, really need to convince them because they say post-social behavior is universal. <laughs> it's not for working class kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I really need to, to, to convince them. It doesn't matter <laughs> we, if, you know, because your belief is that post-social behavior can be, I mean, and it's here and there and it's cross-class. I say it's, it's okay. No, no, no. I just, no, I agree with that. I agree with that. I mean, I mean, I don't agree necessarily that a priori pro-social behavior is a priori existent in all of us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. no, nor do I uh, agree with a priori self-maximizing individualism. The point I'm making mm -hmm. is for working class solidarity to emerge, given the conditions of uh, um, workplace uh, relationships and you know the labor processes it's unlikely that it would emerge from that in current con conditions of precarity um, atomization at the workplace and so on but you're showing that that can still happen precisely because workers are also students and it's happening in school in rest of the world workers and students don't quite overlap in that way therefore in the rest of the world we don't really have any because we don't have student workers uh, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering whether you know that is the is a reasonable conclusion to draw. Um, mm -hmm. I also point out I've seen the audience. Um, yeah. uh, is he yeah. still there, yeah. Professor Francis Stewart, uh, who's uh, a while ago um, co-edited a, a volume uh, on precisely this kind of um, uh, politics of um, cooperation or the absence of it, and she may like to come in on that. But um, yeah, just to say that um, you know they yeah. looked at this yeah. kind of altruism. Uh, and yeah. Actually, I think as uh, the, the experience uh, from the student is 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 not unique in many China because when I really moved to it, to, uh, to look into the situation in Hong Kong, a lot of working class students they still have to work as casual laborers, and I believe in UK, I believe in UK, <laughs> in uh, in the working class uh, communities or districts, uh, and and in some of the I mean ordinary as uh, universities or, or colleges, they have to work. So, so I think uh, my experience of this uh, service, we can, I mean, we, we can try to use those uh, measures and then to see whether as uh, uh, we can also study in other societies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. We, we have a couple questions in the chat. Do either of you, Siraj mm -hmm. or Amelia, wanna unmute and speak your questions or I can read them? Great. And right. Siraj, you're welcome to unmute and. Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Nice to meet you, Poon. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, my research is very much inspired from your first research. And uh, yeah, so uh, I worked uh, in India and like, you know, and uh, did the same sort of, you know, Embedded, sorry, oh, this is my like student friends, you know, uh, background <laughs> noise. <laughs> uh, and then I was wondering, as Nandini was also pointing out, if these subjective experiences and uh, sort of, you know, behavioral uh, support system that uh, workers can kind of, you know, find ways of supporting each other, if they do not translate into a collective action, and these are very much embedded into the labor process experience that they're having on an everyday basis. Uh, so can we really call them as a working class solidarity? Because th those are the sort of, you know, sort of, uh, I would say that since most of the people are poor and they have no other sort of, you know, social systems uh, supporting them, state or anything else. So they have nothing else to rely upon except themselves. And that realization really pushes <laughs> them to sort of, you know, support each other, as you were also pointing out, a uh, worker sort of, you know, saying, okay, today I'm supporting him and tomorrow when I'm in need, they might support me. But that doesn't ever go to challenging the sort of, you know, total hegemony that we find on the shop floors across the sort of you know, different work settings. And until and unless we have that, 
how do we really understand these experiences? Because I understand your general point of you know, this being a experience of solidarity, but can we call it a working class solidarity in a, in a, in a sense of you know, challenging the capital's control dynamics on the shop floor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I entirely agree with that because uh, the the existing literature and also uh, my training has always look at the collective uh, collective actions, and I I personally uh, engage in a number of strike in mainland China that really create trouble for me. <laughs> so so I, I understand uh, I understand uh, the scholarship. I understand the traditions, uh, but still but still I I I, I want to enrich uh, uh, I I want to enrich the whole. Uh, even though I agree that collective action is still uh, the essential uh, essential elements of uh, solidarities, uh, working class solidarities. But apart from collective action, couldn't I mean, couldn't happen every day. So, so why should we why should we, why should we confine to I mean uh, situational moments? Why should we confine to a few a a, a few uh, a few important uh, uh, times, even though uh, uh, they are very important, they are very significant that uh, uh, they can change a little bit. I mean, there's no collective action. I mean, in the current, uh, in the current, I would say in the current decades that we can observe that they can really overthrow the capitals, I mean, production relations. So anyway, they, but we, Obviously, without collective action, we cannot change anything. So I, 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 I entirely agree. I just want to extend, uh, extend uh, our focus and then to look at the everyday life level. And if at the everyday level, that means that uh, they, 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 they don't organize themselves. I mean, they, they organize themselves at a daily level, but not organize themselves to protest, not organize them, themselves to strike. So whether uh, at the everyday life, uh, organizing life, uh, that kind of experience can translate if in time of crisis, if they need to organize a strike, if they need to organize a protest, they are past uh, the organizing at the everyday level can, can support them, I mean, go into that path. So I mean, that's the purpose of my studies. Amelia, did you wanna raise your questions? Yeah. You control other factors. You're, there you go. Yeah. You're muted still. Yeah, we control. We control uh, uh, when we try to uh, run the survey. Uh, when we try to run the scratchable equation, equation model, we control uh, age, gender, uh, also control the who call uh, the who call uh, uh, the who call uh, uh, factors. So she's Amelia's got can't can't get can't speak, but had I think two other questions. Is there a sense that solidarity, the obligation to others, conflicts with individual mobility? And do networks and a sense of solidarity carry beyond the immediately beyond the immediate communities at school? And if so, how? So it's the last two questions in the chat. The, the, the networks and the census. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so the first part of your questions that I, 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 I remember that we, we try to look into the gender, whether uh, the gender uh, as a variable is a significance or not. But at the end, we see uh, the gender didn't really uh, demonstrate as, as significance in look into uh, both male and female students uh, in terms of um, uh, post-social behavior or in terms of working class solidarity. So that's based on the survey. Um, and then uh, uh, obviously um, um, individual mobility and solidarity, again, uh, the example I just uh, explained uh, to Nadine is that uh, in order to win the competition, uh, it's a kind of individual mobility. Because once you once you win the competition, uh, you'll be selected by a, a transnational company uh, to work for them. So that means that you can earn more than the, a university student, even though you're coming from a vocational school. So uh, uh, the promotion of competition is a kind of uh, individual mobility. 
But again, uh, in, uh, in the cases I observe, they really need solidarity. They really need cooperation in order to win, to win <laughs> uh, the competition. So uh, individual uh, mobility uh, in certain, in certain uh, cases, they are, they are not contradictory uh, with solidarity and, and cooperation among those countries. But obviously, obviously, I mean, when we move into the workplace, uh, the, the whole neoliberal ideology, we try to encourage individualization, uh, try, to, uh, try to encourage uh, individual, uh, individual mobility. But again, again, according to my study at the, at the, at the Foscon workplace, at the Foscon workplace, you have to imagine that one single factory, it will have like uh, uh, 10, uh, like 100,000 workers. So 100,000 workers, how could, uh, how could the management ask each workers to compete with one another in order to let certain people climb up? So when a small number, for example, like 5% or 10% of them, they would like to climb up uh, uh, to become a light leader, uh, to become a, a, a lower or middle, middle, uh, middle range of managers. Uh, they will they will immediately I mean exclude themselves to become to another part of the human being <laughs> another part of the human species. If you if you ask those workers because they are the majority of the workers there at the bottom. So uh, so even though uh, uh, the mainstream ideology emphasizes on individual mobility, but, uh, but that kind of ideology is not necessarily effective. And in many cases, in, in, in that kind of uh, big companies, it's difficult uh, uh, to, to, have it, to have an impact. And if, uh, how could, uh, if those uh, uh, sense of solidarity uh, carry beyond uh, the immediate com uh, uh, communities? For example, uh, most of them, after graduation, they have to work inside the workplace. The network that builds inside the vocational school is very helpful for them. <laughs> Uh, 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 you have imagined that one that three they will recruit uh, hundreds and hundreds of students work inside a single company. It's not like two two students that work in a company, another two students work in B companies. It's like two hundred students that work inside one single company. So the network that builds at the vocation school, to me, to be honest, is is very is very important for them to support themselves in terms of transportation, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, if they, uh, uh, they want to uh, learn the knowledge of their companies, uh, they would like to support each others. And uh, if they, at the end, if they would like to form trade union inside, inside uh, the companies, the previous days, uh, the previous day types and the previous uh, solidarities can be translate uh, translate uh, into uh, into the into the uh, I mean, into the new into the new uh, ex experience, and uh, we our our research team uh, not only doing research, we're also doing training inside the vocational schools. So we always emphasize that you have to carry uh, those ties and you have to carry those experience into the workplace. So and I'm. No <laughs> I'm struck with with Nandini's question and then your response to this one at all is that the difference may not be that it's only in China where students are also workers. I think in in much of the world, most even university students, the majority of them, not at the most elite universities, but are working and are often working full time while they're going to school. The difference is they're quite they're quite scattered, right? So they're not all in the same place and building that kind of, any kind of solidarity among themselves. I'm also in listening to you talking about this, thinking about kind of a more elite situation, but in the universities in the US for the PhD students, there's been this kind of ongoing debate about whether they're students mm -hmm. or workers, right? right? Mm -hmm. And that because so many of them do much of the teaching at the big universities, mm -hmm. both the teaching and the, um, and the science laboratory kind of work, there's been moves to have them be treated as workers and the universities 
are trying to counter that typically by saying they're not workers. That is part of their apprenticeship and, and training. Um, but a, it's a really interesting, completely different site for thinking about some of those same kinds of kinds of issues. Yes, yes, yes. In certain cases, they're quite enlightened. I mean, because they understand themselves. Those PhD students, they understand themselves as precarious labor. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and you look at what's happening in academia more generally, and some of that work is is precarious. Sorry to say that to any of our PhD students on the <laughs> <laughs> sitting in the in the virtual room today. So, um, I think we are out of questions, and we're about out of time. So let me just take this final so chance to say thank you very much. It's been very nice to have you with us today, and hope that we'll be able to have you back at some point for a conversation a bit more face to face. Okay, so. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.